Well, good morning. morning. Welcome. Today we are starting a brand new four-week series called If Then. And the premise of this series comes from the if-then conditional statement, also known as the if-else statements. This concept is fundamental in both computer programming and logical reasoning. And its origins, they trace all the way back to ancient Greece, to ancient Greek philosophy, specifically to the work of a guy named Aristotle. Now, Aristotle, he lived around 350 B.C., during the Greek Empire, and he was the personal tutor to a young Alexander the Great. And this is several hundred years, you know, before Jesus is born. Now, Aristotle introduced this idea of syllogisms, a logical argument in which a conclusion is drawn from two premises. Premises? Premises. One of which included a condition. Here's an example. All humans are mortal... Socrates is human, therefore Socrates is mortal. And the statement can be translated in an if-then statement as follows. If someone is human, then they are mortal. Socrates is human, therefore he is mortal. Now you may may be familiar with this concept from classes in math or science or even computer programming, right? And over the next few weeks, we're going to see how this general concept applies to several key teachings of Jesus Christ. But first, let's pray, and then we'll get into our topic for today, okay? Father, thank you, Lord, for the encouragement and the hope that we find in your word. As we go into the world, help us to remember that we belong to you, and our true identity is found in Christ Jesus. Give us the strength to stand firm in our faith, even when we face rejection persecution, and difficulty. In Jesus' name we pray. And all God's children said, amen. So just as the if-then principle is used in computer programming and logic, we also see this familiar principle at work in the Bible today. As we dive into John 14, verses 1 through 14 together, we learn this. If you really know Jesus then you know some pretty incredible truths about salvation and God and living an empowered life. Really knowing Jesus is really knowing life. So if you know Jesus, then you know life. You know, it's one thing to know about another person. It's a whole different thing to actually know the person through a mutually beneficial and encouraging relationship. Let me give you an example. I know Lisa. She's my best friend. I know a whole bunch of stuff about Lisa, facts and such. For example, I know that she was born in Thousand Oaks, California. She was adopted in the 60s to a Japanese mom and an Irish dad. I know that she grew up in Garden Grove. And I know that she started out at high school at La Quinta, but she ended up graduating from Bolsa Grande High School. I know that she was in choir in high school and that she loves music, especially 70s music, often known as yacht rock. I also know that when she was a teenager, she was in a really bad car accident and almost died. But you know what all that stuff is? It's just facts, right? Anybody can find that stuff out. That's knowing about Lisa, but knowing Lisa is way more than this. Knowing Lisa means knowing how she thinks and how she feels. Knowing her, for example, is, is, is knowing that the thing that she needs most is quality time when we're together. My full attention on her and what we're doing. And that's something I'm not so good at. It's knowing her well enough to know that when she's baking in the kitchen because she wants to do nice things for people versus baking in the kitchen to blow off steam because I've frustrated her for the umpteenth time today. You see the difference? Knowing about somebody doesn't mean you really know them. In a similar vein, it's, it's one thing to know about Jesus. That's facts and figures of his life, the names of his siblings and, and the things that he's done. It's a whole different thing to have a relationship with Jesus. A mutually beneficial, encouraging relationship, it takes time to develop and years to cultivate. And that's, the, that's true in our human relationships, and that's, that's true with Jesus. Now, the re- really beautiful thing here is that Jesus wants us to know him, 
to really know him on this intimate level. Studying the Bible is good, but having a relationship with Jesus is better. One of my seminary professors used to say that having the right doctrine and theology is very important. I mean, it was, after all, what he was teaching, right? He says, but it's not important as being in love with Jesus. Having the right theology and the right doctrine is important, but it's not as important as, as, as being in love with Jesus. So what's true is that the more that you get to know Jesus, the more you understand about the Father and the Spirit and ultimately the kingdom of heaven. So as we're about to see from our passage in John chapter 14, if you really know Jesus, then you know some pretty incredible truths about salvation and God the Father and living an empowered life, right? I'd even venture to say that if you know Jesus, then you know life. So first in our series is if if you know me is this if then syllogism right that we're going to look at and we're going to encounter in our passage here this morning so if you have your bible with you open them up to uh, the gospel of john chapter 14 and we're going to read through the first 14 verses to sort of get a bird's eye kind of view on our story this morning before we drill down and look at our specific statement okay So if you're able, please stand for the reading of Scripture today. Don't let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God and also trust in me. There is more than enough room in my Father's house. If this were not so, would I have told you that I am going to prepare a place for you? When everything is ready, I will come and get you so that you will always be with me where I am. And you know the way to where I am going. No, we don't know, Lord, Thomas said. We have no idea where you're going, so how can we know the way? And Jesus told him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you had really known me, you would have known who my Father is. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. Philip said, Lord, show us the Father and we will be satisfied. Jesus replied, have I been with you all this time, Philip, and you still don't know who I am? Anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. So why are you asking me to show him to you? Don't you believe that I am in the Father and that the Father is in me? The words I speak are not my own, but my Father who lives in me and does his work through me. Just believe that I am in the Father and that the Father is in me, or at least believe because of the work you've seen me do. I tell you the truth. Anyone who believes in me will do the same works I've done and even greater works because I am going to be with the Father. You can ask for anything in my name and I will do it so that the Son can bring glory to the Father. Yes, ask me for anything in my name and I will do it. Word of the Lord. Praise be to God. You may be seated. To open our passage, Jesus tells the disciples, do not let your hearts be troubled. Which begs this question, right? What were they troubled by, and why is Jesus addressing it? The disciples were likely troubled because Jesus had just told them that he was going to go away. And that they could not follow him to where he was going at that time. We we read this in John chapter 13, verse 33. So this news would have been confusing and it would have been distressing to the disciples who had left everything that they known to follow Jesus and had come to believe that, you know, he is the Messiah. So Jesus addresses the disciples' troubled hearts by reassuring them that he is going to prepare a place for them in his father's house and that he will come back and take them with him so that they will be with him wherever he is. And he also emphasizes the importance of faith in him, telling his disciples that they must believe in him just as they believe in God. And so what we have here in this opening to this chapter is a glimpse of the heart of Jesus and how he thinks and how he feels and and what his priorities are. Bible commentator D.A. Carson wrote about this passage. This is what he said. He said, it is Jesus 
who is heading for the agony of the cross. It is Jesus who is deeply troubled in his heart and in his spirit. And yet on this night of nights, when, when it, of at all times, it would have been appropriate for Jesus' followers to lend him emotional support and spiritual support, he's the one who gives and comforts and instructs. You see? That's his heart. He knew that his disciples were troubled and they were confused, not because they were rushing towards pain or shame or crucifixion, but because they were confused and uncertain of what Jesus meant and threatened by his references of his imminent departure. So overall, Jesus' words in this section are meant to comfort and reassure his disciples in the face of his impending departure. And he wants them to know that he has a plan for them. And that they can trust him to take care of them, even when he's not physically present with them. And this entire exchange, it leads to Thomas's to rightly ask, Lord, we don't know where you are going, so how can we know the way? And this is where we get to our first powerful point for this morning. If you know Jesus, then you know the way. Jesus is the way. This is what he says. Jesus tells his disciples, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no one can come to the Father except through me. And at this point, you would imagine that Thomas and the other disciples would begin to understand that knowing Jesus means recognizing he is the only path to God and that, and that everyone who must follow him in, in order to, you know, have eternal life. And this truth, that Jesus is the only way to heaven, it continues to be a difficult reality to accept in a world that wants nothing more than to have like a thousand different ways and pathways to eternal life. But we must remember that that only Jesus can lead us to true peace and to salvation. That's what the Bible says. And so if we trust that what the Bible says is true, then we can only conclude, right, that you got to know Jesus to know the Father. And you got to know the Father. To get to the Father is the only way to get eternal life, right? This is the way, and it's been set up by the Father. And Jesus tells the disciples that if they really know him, then they know the Father as well, that they're one, right? At this point, Philip speaks up. Lord, show us the Father, and that'll be enough for us. And you can almost hear the frustration in Jesus' response. Look back with me. If you have your Bibles open to uh, verses 9 through 11. If you don't, that's okay. Um, But anyway, Jesus responds like this. Have I been with you all this time, Philip, and yet you still don't know who I am? Anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. So why are you asking me to show him to you? Don't you believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? The words that I'm speaking to you are not my own words, but my Father who lives in me and does his work through me. Just believe that I am in the Father and that the Father is in me, or at least believe because of the works you've seen me do. Now, you know, it's hard to imagine that Jesus, who is gentle and lowly and kind and compassionate, would get frustrated or even angry, but it sure seems that in this instance, he's kind of perturbed at Philip's request, right? You can, you can hear the frustration in his, in his response. Don't you believe that I am in the Father and that the Father is in me? And through this interaction, we we even learn that the words that Jesus speaks come from the authority of the Father. So to know Jesus is to know the Father because through Jesus, we get to hear from the Father and see what he's like. We get to see how he would respond to certain situations that come up in life. And we see this evidence of a connection through the works that Jesus does, the way he acts, who he heals, and how he ministers to people. So knowing Jesus means understanding that he is the perfect representation of God on earth, and that by studying his life and his teachings, we can come to know the Father more deeply. So in a world where where people have many misconceptions about who God is or, or what he desires for us to do, all we need to do is look to Jesus as our guide and our example. That's why we study him. 
That's why we study his words and his commandments. Because if you know Jesus, then you know the Father. But that's not all there is to this, is there? There's also something amazing and powerful about knowing Jesus. Jesus empowers us. We read this in our passage in verses 12 to 14. I tell you the truth, if anyone believes in me, he will do works, the same works I have done, and even greater works, because I am going to be with the Father. And so you can ask anything in my name, and I will do it so that the Son may bring glory to the Father. Yes, ask me for anything in my name, and I will do it for you. This is arguably one of the most interesting and potentially confusing passages in all of Scripture, right? Jesus tells his disciples that they will do even greater works than he did because he is going to the Father on their behalf. Now think about that for a moment. Jesus is interceding. He is advocating and petitioning over the request that you speak in his name. This one truth alone could, could radically transform a person's prayer life in response to this passage, right? And so, so one of the things that we've heard in, in response to this passage, there was a, a pastor named Tony Evans, and he said this. He said, the power of prayer is not in the words that we say or the formula that we follow, but in the one to whom we pray. It is God who answers prayers, not our eloquence, or our effort. And when we approach him in faith and trust, seeking his will and his glory, he will move on our, beha- on our behalf in ways that are, are beyond our imagination. So knowing Jesus means recognizing that he empowers us to carry on the, his work in this world and to spread his message of love and salvation to others. In a world where there's so much darkness and so much despair, we can be a light to others through our faith in Jesus and our actions of love and service. That's what we're about here at this church, right? Lighthouse. Shining Christ's light in our community. We can intercede and pray and ask for miracles because we share our requests through Jesus, the Almighty Father of God. Of course, we need to be careful with this amazing power, right? We need to stay humble and we need to be grounded and we need to be rooted in Jesus Christ as we pray for his will to be done here on earth and in heaven. One commentator warns us by saying this, prayer is not a means of getting what we want, but aligning our will with God's will. And when we pray according to his will, we can be confident that he will answer our prayers. But if we pray selfishly, seeking only to fulfill our own desires, we're probably not going to get what we ask for. When I was little, I used to pray for, you know, a Porsche. I didn't get a Porsche. Because that was not God's will, right? That was what I wanted. So we have this incredible kingdom power in Jesus Christ. And we can know the Father through Christ. And we can experience eternal life because Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. And if you know Jesus, then you know life. Full life. Abundant life, as it says in John 10, 10, right? Which begs this question. What are you going to do about it? What are you going to do about it? So as we wrap up today, I, I, think, I think it's worth recognizing that even those early disciples who walked daily with Jesus had their own questions, they had their own doubts, and they didn't fully understand all that Jesus was trying to reveal to them. They needed help. They needed things to be explained logically and sequentially and clearly. And as we have begun to learn here this morning, Jesus is a very logical person in the way that he thought and the way he communicated. So I know that there are others here today who just need help, right? People here who are troubled, who are troubled in their hearts. But let's remember Jesus' opening words to us today. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Why? Because he is taking care of our eternity on our behalf, 
on your behalf, on my behalf, and for his church right here at Lighthouse. Yes, he is the only way. Yes, he knows the Father and they are one. And yes, we are going to do even greater things than he did because he is interceding on our behalf. And yes, he has a room prepared for you in heaven. It's waiting for your arrival. This is the logic of Christ. This is how the Father has set it all up. So with that in mind, I think that the call for us today is to truly live. If you know Jesus, you know life. So truly live abundantly. And share the love and the gospel with everyone that you can. Model your life after Jesus Christ and live according to his commandments. And that's the goal for now. Because eternity is just around the corner. It's just around the corner. I know that for some of you, when I say that eternity is just around the corner, that might be scary. That might bring up feelings of fear, right? But fear not, and do not let your hearts be troubled. Because if you know Jesus, then you know life. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you we thank you that you want to have a relationship with us, a deep relationship with us. Lord, that you want to share with us everything, all of our experiences, all of our love, all of our experiences. Lord, you want this relationship with us. We are so thankful, Lord, that we can we can know a lot of things about you, and that's good. But we're so thankful that we can have a relationship with you. And that relationship defines who we are, changes who we are, and provides meaning for what we do. That you want, Lord, to, to impact our lives in every way. That you want to empower us to do amazing things not for our glory, Lord, but for, for the Father's glory in heaven. And so, Lord, when, when we pray in your name for people to be healed, you are there with the Father interceding on our behalf, bringing about healing, bringing about peace, bringing about change in our communities, in our society. And we thank you for that, Lord. That if we know you, we know life. Help us to know life, Lord. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.